60 years ago this week, the Beatles released their debut album, Please Please Me. It spent an unprecedented 30 weeks at number one in the UK album chart and still holds the record for the longest continuous stay by an album at number one. In this video, we'll tell you the full story of this album and how it became a success not just in the UK, but around the world too. We'll also show you the earliest and rarest vinyl pressings, as well as some other fascinating formats. And we'll dive deep into the album's sound quality to find out which is the best sounding pressing in both mono and stereo. I'm Andrew from Parlogram, and welcome to this celebration of 60 years of the Please Please Me album. Despite the success of the Please Please Me single in January, there was no guarantee, at least as far as EMI were concerned, that a Beatles album would be a success. One of the reasons for that was that albums were traditionally not big sellers amongst teenagers and were seen more as an expensive luxury for a more mature audience. Well, that was certainly true for albums in the Parlophone catalogue, which up to March 1963 had consisted of a mishmash of comedy, nostalgia, novelty, exotic foreign music and Scottish country dancing. In fact, the Parlophone album released directly before Please Please Me was an album of Scandinavian sailor songs by a Swedish singer named William Clausen. Another reason why teenagers didn't buy albums was one of cost. In 1963, the price of a regular album in the UK was £1.12 shillings and sixpence, the equivalent of around £40 or $50 today and that was the kind of money your average teenager just didn't have lying around. Your only hope of getting one was on your birthday or at Christmas, or if you were lucky, a friend might have one which you could then borrow. The format of choice for the majority of teenage record buyers was the 45 RPM single, and although not exactly cheap at six shillings and eight pence each, which is around eight pounds fifty or ten dollars today, they were the lifeblood not just of the teenagers but of the record companies too. 45s were cheap and easy to produce and were the record company's most profitable product. But an early sign of how invested EMI were in the Beatles was that cover versions of two of Please Please Me tracks had already been recorded before the album was released. Fellow EMI artist Kenny Lynch released Misery on HMV a week before the album's release on March the 14th. And although it wasn't released till May 1963, Duffy Powers' cover version of I Saw Her Standing There had been recorded two days before the album's release on March the 20th. However, the honour of recording the first cover version of a Beatles song goes to a group called the Typhoons, who recorded a cover version of Please Please Me for Woolworth's Embassy label in February 1963. I'll put links to all three songs in the description so you can hear them for yourself. If you'd gone along to your local record shop and bought a copy of the Please Please Me album on release day, it would have been in mono and the label would have looked like this. Although EMI had by this time completed the changeover of their single labels from the colourful designs of the 1950s to a more austere generic black design, they still had a large quantity of the old style LP labels in stock. And far from being a company to waste anything, those final batches of gold Parlophone labels were used up on initial copies of Please Please Me. Now, as I said, the album you would have bought that release day would have been in mono, for the plain fact that there was no stereo copy available. Despite being mixed for stereo, it wouldn't be released in that format until five weeks later, on April the 26th. EMI were clearly unsure about the demand for such a pressing, and historically not all Parlophone albums had been issued in both mono and stereo formats. Even though stereo had been around for a good five years in 1963, stereo pop albums were not big sellers. Stereo was still at that point the domain of hi-fi loving classical music collectors and was seemingly of no interest to teenage pop fans, 
who listen to their records on cheap mono players, such as the ubiquitous dance set. And if they weren't expensive enough already, some retailers charged more for stereo albums. But it's likely that the early success of the album convinced EMI that more money could be made, and so they ordered the release of a stereo pressing. Those earliest stereo copies came, like the monos, with the old-style black and gold labels, before they were replaced just a few weeks later by the more familiar black and yellow label design. Only 900 copies were rumoured to have been pressed, and even fewer were sold, making them a holy grail for Beatles collectors. If you're interested in learning more about this iconic pressing and why it's literally worth its weight in gold, I'll put a link to our dedicated video about that in the description. As a young record collector, I would always dream of stumbling over a gold label pressing of this album in a junk or charity shop, but I never did. But these black and yellow label copies were everywhere. So they're not really that rare. But for a bit of fun, I'll show you one which is. I'll give you 10 seconds to look at this label and spot the printing error, which makes it worth a few hundred pounds. Ready? Let's go. Well, the answer is that a taste of honey and there's a place have switched places. Well done if you got it. Reviews of the album were terrific, and it quickly became Britain's best-selling LP, hitting the number one spot on the album chart on May the 11th, where it stayed for an unprecedented 30 weeks. In their end-of-year poll, the enemy declared Please Please Me as the best-selling album of the year, narrowly beating West Side Story, which illustrates just how adult-orientated the album market was. In fact, do you know what the UK's best-selling album was in the 1960s? Well, it wasn't Sgt Pepper. It was The Sound of Music. Of course, Please Please Me became a great success in many other countries around the world too. And here are some of those. Of course, Please Please Me wasn't issued in the US in 1963. The nearest American fans got to it was Introducing the Beatles, although that contained only 12 of the UK album's 14 tracks. Now this album has a fascinating history behind it, and we'll be looking at it in depth in a few weeks' time, so make sure you subscribe now so you don't miss out on that. Please Please Me didn't get an official release stateside until 1987 in the form of this digitally sourced mono pressing on Capitol. But more about that later. Twelve tracks from the album also turned up on Capitol Canada's second Beatles album, Twist and Shout, in February 1964, which also added From Me to You and She Loves You to the lineup. We've already made a video featuring this and the other early Canadian albums. So if you're interested in watching those, check out the links in the description. As well as appearing on vinyl in 1963, EMI also issued the album on one of their newest domestic formats, the pre-recorded reel-to-reel tape. EMI had been producing consumer pre-recorded reel-to-reels since 1955, and they were on high-quality 7.5 inches per second tapes on 7-inch reels. 
The problem with these was that because they were copied in real time from the master tapes, they were extremely expensive to produce and buy. Now, one of these would have cost you between two and four pounds each, which is 50 to 100 pounds today, but they really do sound amazing. By the early 1960s, reel-to-reels, with their ability to record as well as play back, began to capture the wider public's imagination, and the market was soon flooded with more affordable consumer machines. Despite being the same price as something essential like a refrigerator, sales took off, as did the demand for a wider variety of tapes, which EMI quickly capitalized on. So the duplication speed was increased to four to one, and the playback speed was lowered to three and three quarter inches per second, and a selection of pop albums were released. Please Please Me was released on Reel to Reel in May 1963, priced at 35 shillings, three shillings more than the vinyl album. It briefly appeared in four-track stereo on that format in 1968, before pre-recorded reel-to-reels were replaced by the compact cassette in October 1970. In order to make each side of the cassette run to an equal length, and of course to save tape, the order of the songs was switched around, which makes for a very odd listening experience. Side one opens not with your standard one, two, three, four, but with misery of all things, and that's followed by Chains, P.S. I Love You, and Do You Want to Know a Secret. In fact, the only songs in their correct positions are Ask Me Why and Twist and Shout. The same lineup also appears on the eight track cartridge, which like a lot of the early EMI cartridges, sounds pretty decent. The correct track listing was restored on the XDR, Expanded Dynamic Range Cassettes in 1987. That was also the year the album first appeared on CD, on February the 26th to be exact, along with the following three other albums, all of which were in mono too. Unfortunately, that CD suffered from phasing issues due to the mono master being transferred using a tape machine fitted with a stereo head. The stereo remasters and mono CD box sets were released in September 2009 followed by the stereo vinyl box set in November 2012 and the legendary mono vinyl set in September 2014. When discussions arise about the best sounding Beatles albums, Please Please Me rarely gets a look in. But bear with me here in this section as I tell you what I think are the best sounding pressings in both mono and stereo. Original UK mono pressings of this album are fairly easy to find for not much money. These black and yellow label copies are quite plentiful and even beat up looking ones still play surprisingly well. The 2009 mono CD sounds excellent and is the one to get for those who like to hear their music on that format. This 1987 Capital mono pressing, even though it was cut from a digital source, sounds surprisingly good and has the advantage over the contemporary European pressing of not being a DMM pressing. But for me, the best sounding mono pressing has to be the 2014 mono vinyl. Although cut much quieter than any of the other pressings I've mentioned, it rolls back that upper mid-range boost of the original and has a decent low end. Plus, it's 100% analog. Now, prices for this pressing are averaging around the $100 mark at the moment, with the box set going for at least 10 times more. So why, when there's such a demand, Apple can't repress them as individual albums, or at least make them available on streaming, is beyond me. Now, whilst we're on the subject of mono, I want to take a closer look at the mono tracks which were issued on the two UK EPs. Twist and Shout from July 1963 and The Beatles Number no. 1 from September of that same year. I did a comparison test using original copies of the EPs and a 1963 mono pressing of the album, and I was really surprised with the results. And that was that the tracks on this EP sounded way better than the same tracks on the LP. 
So much so that they actually sound like they're from a generation up. But how can that be? Now we know that the tracks on the mono album were basically remixes of the twin track stereo mix. But I think the source for the tracks on this EP are from the Delta mono tape. Now, if you watched last week's video about the recording of this album, you'll know that Delta Mono was the live and dedicated mono mix which was made simultaneously with the Twin Track Stereo recording. Now, you understand that I can't, for copyright reasons, play you the completed tracks. And to be honest, you may not even hear the difference between them after YouTube's compression and all that. So instead, let's take a look at some waveforms. This is a waveform of the EP's title track, Twist and Shout. And this is a recording from the UK Mono LP. The blue waveform represents amplitude or volume over time. The orange shadow behind it, which we're not too bothered about in this example, represents the strength of individual frequencies. Now, as you can hopefully see, the waveform from the LP recording below is much fatter, i.e. louder than the EP above, which also has a more spiky waveform, which means it has more dynamics. If you listen to both side by side, you'll immediately hear that the EP sounds clearer and has much more detail than the LP version, and is overall a superior sounding record. It's the same for all the other three tracks too, A Taste of Honey, Do You Want to Know a Secret, and There's a Place. On the other hand, there's no noticeable improvement in fidelity on the Beatles' number one EP. All of its tracks sound exactly the same as on the LP. And that's not a surprise, as it even states on the Mono Master tape box that this tape was used to cut the tracks for this EP. However, there's no such notation on the box for the tracks used for Twist and Shout. Therefore, in my opinion, the tracks on this EP must have come from a different source, which may have been that elusive Delta Mono tape. But what do you think? If you have an original UK EP and LP, why not do your own comparison and let me know the results? I'm always open to correction, and after all, this is all just my opinion. Now, I know that the stereo mix of this album isn't everyone's cup of tea, and I get that. The harsh separation between the vocals and the instruments can be annoying and especially distracting on headphones. But if you love this album, you really need to have a decent stereo pressing of it in your collection. So allow me to present you a couple of candidates for your consideration as the best sounding stereo pressing. Firstly, I know that a lot of people's favourite stereo vinyl is the Mobile Fidelity Pressing, which was first released in June 1983. Now, there's no doubting this pressing's credentials. It was cut from the best source available, the UK Stereo Album Master Tape. It was half-speed mastered by the great Stan Ricker, and it's pressed on ultra-quiet, high-quality Japanese super vinyl. And even though it has been subjected to some smiley face EQ, I understand why many people love the sound of this pressing. It's warm, smooth, and has none of the original's harsh upper mid-range boost. The fact that it can sound a little harsh on the S's is preferable to many than too much mid-range. A lot of people don't care about something sounding 100% accurate and enjoy the details these EQ choices bring out. And at least it's 100% analog. The other candidate I present for the best sounding stereo pressing is this. This is a German second pressing. This particular copy dates from the early 70s, but the crucial detail is that it has dash two matrices on both sides, which first appeared in 1967 or possibly 1968. Incidentally, this cutting continued to be used throughout the 1970s and up to 1984 when it was pressed on the Apple label. But copies pressed after that date, which have A to B1 matrices, are DMM cuttings, and they contain a completely different mastering. So why does this A to B2 pressing sound so good, and is it better than the MFSL? Well, that is and has been the subject of hot debate on the music forums for the past 20 years. 
One theory is that it was cut not from the regular stereo production master tape, which is the one Mobile Fidelity used for their pressing, but from a different twin track tape, which was made after overdubs, but before compression and EQ were added. The second theory is that the German engineers simply lowered the volume of the instrumental channel and did some surgical EQ. Well, until someone presents me with some hard evidence, a tape box, for example, showing that this was cut from an alternative uncompressed tape, I'm going with the second rebalancing and EQing theory. Anyway, theories aside, let's have a look at some waveforms to see if they give us any further clues as to why these pressings are so highly praised. Here's the waveform of the song I saw her standing there which I recorded directly from a 1969 UK stereo pressing with the original Dash 1 cutting. The waveform on top is the vocal channel, and the one below shows the instrumental channel. Now, let's see how it changes as I switch to the waveform of the MFSL pressing. The first thing to notice is that the volume of the vocal channel has been reduced, or at least smoothed out and the volume of the instrumental channel appears to have been raised slightly. Now look at what happens when I switch to the German pressing. The vocal channel above remains more or less the same, but there's a drop in the level of the instrumental track. And it's that rebalancing of the instrumental track, as well as less heavy-handed EQ tweaks, which, in my opinion, gives the German pressing the edge over not just the MFSL, but the original too. So if you have the MFSL pressing, or indeed any other good sounding stereo pressing, try rebalancing it yourself by dropping the instrumental channel by about three decibels, which should bring you close to the sound of the German pressing. This is of course just my opinion, but I, and I'm sure everyone else, would like to know yours in the comments. The next big question is of course, when is this album going to get the remix box set treatment? Well, I can tell you one thing for sure, it's not on the 60th anniversary. Maybe they're planning a combined 1963 box set to tie in with the 60th anniversary of With The Beatles in November. Who knows? But this album, although not everyone's favorite, is such an important album in the history of the Beatles, and I really love it. Every track is full of their enthusiasm, spirit, and energy they really were trying their hardest to please us, as opposed to themselves on some of the later albums, and it mustn't be overlooked. Do you have any stories connected with this album? And what memories does it hold for you? Whatever you think, do leave a comment. I promise that I do read every one. We sometimes have great sounding and rare copies of this album for sale, which you can find along with many other great pressings of Beatles albums at our website, parlogramauctions.com. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back next week with another video of rare vinyl from the Beatles Museum. So I hope you'll join me for that. But in the meantime, after spending all this time talking about this album, I really want to listen to it now. And maybe you do too. So I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.